The Health Fix Podcast teaches you how to take charge of your health naturally by giving you the information you need to elevate your health. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause. Dr. Carla Manley is on the podcast again today, and I'm so excited. She's a clinical psychologist, author, and wellness expert who makes her home in Sonoma County, California. With a holistic body, mind, spirit approach, Dr. Manley specializes in the treatment of anxiety, depression, trauma, and relationship issues. She blends traditional psychotherapy with alternative mindfulness practices such as yoga and meditation. And she's back again today, and we're going to be talking about how to build a stronger self-esteem by breaking old fear-based habits and creating new healthy ones. Now, If you are curious, Dr. Carla was on back in episode 152 where we talked all about her books, Joy from Fear and Aging Joyfully, but today we're going to dive a little bit more into self-esteem and getting that self-esteem rock solid to be able to achieve anything you want. So let's get on with the podcast. All right, health junkies, I've brought Dr. Carla Marie Manley back again because you know what? I think all of us need a good dose of mental health support, so we are going to do round two. Today, we're going to be talking about how to build a stronger self-esteem by breaking old fear-based habits and creating new healthy ones. Welcome back to the Health Fix podcast, Dr. Manley. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to be here. Woohoo. Well, we are going to get started and dive right in. I think this is a big deal, this self esteem business, because I myself feel like some days I'm great and I'm rock star on it, and other days I'm like bottom of the barrel, comparing myself to people, finding myself getting hurt by things that are said when the person clearly didn't mean what they said. And, and I feel like I'm probably not the only one in this department. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. And you brought up two things that I think are at the foundation of many self-esteem issues. One is that voice of comparison. And the second that you brought up, and we can go into each of these in more depth, but the voice of comparison is one of the first things that really works against us. And the other piece, again, and and you brought it up, is that sense of, wait a second, I'm not always feeling great about myself, as if that's not normal. We have ebbs and flows in how we feel about ourselves. Oh, that's so good to hear that everyone ebbs and flows because, you know, there's a lot out there on social media and, you know, folks of body positivity and mental positivity. And I feel like sometimes we just need someone out to be out there and say, yeah, you know what? Sometimes you do get down in the dumps and sometimes everything sucks. Absolutely. And, you know, I'll share something personal. <laughs> <laughs> That's just so funny to me that my self-esteem generally rocks. I'm, you know, internally oriented, not really looking out. Now, mind you, that came hard one. It's not something <clears throat> that was natural for me. But I can be guaranteed that if I go into a dressing room anywhere, my self-esteem generally takes a hit. I don't know what it is about the dressing rooms, if it's that I'm slightly claustrophobic, that the lighting is terrible, or that there's just something that we expect, a swimsuit or a dress, you know, we expect it to make us instantly appear like the airbrushed models in the mirror. So I really, and I wanted to share that with listeners, because It's important to know what your triggers are. And I just offered you from my heart one of my triggers. And so what do I do? I try to avoid dressing rooms because I know it's kind of a setup for me. And so I'd much prefer to bring a dress or a swimsuit home in the comfort of my home where I can try it on with space around me. And then my self-esteem doesn't take a hit. I can have a loved one give me feedback when I'm not, you know, in a, in a frenzy to buy something. And so I think it's important for each of us to know what our triggers are, whether it's the comment of a friend, um, whether it's looking at a television show or a model or being in a dressing room. So I think those are all important pieces 
Oh my gosh. I think the dressing room is a hot trigger for a lot of people. I'm personally convinced that the lighting in there is terrible on purpose. I'm, if they, you know, I'm kind of going, well, if they would have marketed better, they would get better lighting. And then you wouldn't be looking at all of your little imperfections instead of looking at yourself in the actual dress or swimsuit or whatever it may be. Oh, such a hot trigger. It is a hot trigger. And one of my fun things, if I'm forced to be in a dressing room, and I was over the summer where I had, I needed something for um, an event and I didn't have anyone to go with me. And I walked and I've done this before, so I'm kind of used to it. And I walk out into the hallway, you know, the, the hallway of the dressing room, not of the store. And there were other women there trying their things on with their friends. And I just asked them, what do you think of this? And, they're, <laughs> and they are so helpful because they can see you're there alone. They can see that you're vulnerable. And sometimes they'll give you the best feedback. They'll say, oh, you know, it's a little long on you or a little shorter. Uh, maybe try a different color, right? And so we can learn how to do workarounds with our, with our little triggers. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that is a good way to do it. Sometimes you got to get a little bit of guts to actually ask the folks. <laughs> but well, And you know what the, that's beautiful about doing that is that it connects you to other human beings who we know we share some of these same experiences. And so being there and being vulnerable and being willing to take feedback, guess what, Dr. Janine? <laughs> It builds self-confidence. So doing some of those things, actually, it's not really, you know, you can actually use it as a self-esteem builder. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm going to now try that out. Go by myself and see, see what comes of it. That's a good one. I think, I think a lot of people could gain a lot of, of progress from just that one. Now, let's go back to talking about the first big one, comparing ourselves to others. I think there's a lot of depth within that conversation just in general. What do you find in, in your practice that is the most common thing that patients will come in complaining about in terms of comparing themselves to others? I think that comparison to others is something that generally is in one way or another in almost every client session I have. And that's how rampant it is. And that's why in my book, Joy from Fear, I call it out as this, the voice of toxic comparison. And here's why it's so dangerous. Because if we are we wake up and we're happy, right? And we're feeling good and having a great day. And then we look at our phone and we see, you know, our best friend in Hawaii wearing a bikini and laughing it up with her sweetheart uh, on the picture that, that's on Instagram or Facebook or wherever. And we're in cold weather or <laughs> feeling a little heavy or sluggish. All of a sudden, there goes the happy day. There goes the happy mood because we did what? We consciously or unconsciously compared ourselves not only to the body of another human being, but the facial expression of the other human being. We are comparing our relationship to the relationship that this person has with their significant other. So all of these comparisons start occurring unconsciously just because we looked at a picture that is, by the way, a picture of a brief, often posed moment in time that may or may not reflect the person's actual life. Man, it's true. It's true. I think a lot of us now, thanks to social media, might have more ups and downs throughout the day. Because I will admit that some of my downs throughout the day, I'll see some friends skiing and they will have just posted, you know, I don't know if they wrecked two seconds after they posted, but in that post, I'm like, I want to be skiing instead of stuck in the office today. Yeah. Oh. Yes. And there is, um, it's so important for us to learn to listen because toxic comparison is very sneaky, as you said. Who would think you're, you're sitting there, you're doing your work, and all of a sudden you're thinking about somebody else who's skiing. So there you are con perfectly content 
<laughs> doing your work and now your mental shape your mental state has shifted into one of i should be or i wish i were and so bringing ourselves back to the present you know being in that mindful place noticing when comparison comes up in its many many forms and then bringing ourselves back to the present it's so important Oh, man. Yeah, if we get back into the present and go, okay, my life's not that bad. Yeah, I wish I could be skiing, but it's not so bad. I have all my favorite clients today. It's a great lineup. You know, I, I could see how shifting would be easy in that situation. But what about in a situation in which someone's going into some really deep comparisons where they're kind of attacking their core of their existence? That's a really good point. So what I say when we're working with that, which is an inner critic, right? Mm -hmm. That instead of ignoring the inner critic, that it's important to notice um, when it's coming up and actually talk to it. And I love thinking about the inner critic, critic as if it's a not so good friend. <laughs> we give it a face. We give it a name. I work with a client who we've called her inner critic, you know, by a certain name. I'll give it a different name. We'll call it um, Sarah. And so when Sarah steps in, in she shifts. And so when Sarah steps in, we talk to, to Sarah and we say, okay, Sarah, is what you're saying helpful in any way, shape or form? Generally, Sarah has nothing helpful to say. <laughs> she's mean, she's harsh, she's nasty. And so we kind of look at Sarah as being this wicked, evil stepmother. And we say, hey, Sarah, you're not helping me. This doesn't feel good. I choose to close the door on you today. Go outside. And then we go on. So we're noticing. And sometimes, actually, Sarah will have something helpful to say. She will be saying, hey, don't eat that extra cupcake. You had one. That's enough. So then we look at, and we talk to her and we say, well, Sarah, is what you're saying helpful? Oh, yeah, actually, it is helpful. Thank you. I don't really need a second cupcake. That first one was really good. So thanks, Sarah. Okay, bye-bye now. And so then when we learn to start talking, because we all have these different little voices running around in our being, in our psyche, and so it's okay to talk to them. I like that. I think a lot of people might be thinking like, okay, that's kind of weird. But I mean, obviously you don't have to talk out loud to them. Um, well, <laughs> you do. I love what you were saying. And <laughs> for me, we're talking to them anyway. True. So why not call it out and have a two-way conversation. Because trust me, Sarah's in there saying some pretty nasty things. What friend would you let walk in your front door and talk to you that way and just let her be there? No, if somebody walks into your space and says, oh God, you're so ugly, you're so fat, you're just not achieving much today, are you? Would say, hey, <laughs> excuse me, but you need to leave now. This doesn't feel good. Why wouldn't we, and that's not, we don't consider that weird. Why True. would we consider focusing on this inner voice, taking control of it, and training it to have boundaries? Ooh, I like that. I <laughs> like that. That's, that makes it all a, a better shift. So giving that new voice the boundaries, giving your, you know, this is new behaviors, these are new habits. Let's, let's talk about this, these boundaries a little bit. So say, I mean... I'm not going to lie. I know that I have an inner Sarah in my head that communicates with me and sometimes will be like, you can't do this. There's no way you can do this or there's no way you can, you know, you're not good enough. You're not as smart enough. Those are kind of what things go in my head. So now everyone knows, full disclosure, my head, not good enough, not smart enough, can't figure this out. What's wrong with you? Kind of conversations. Where would we start with, with Sarah trying to communicate with her or change the habit in the head or change the, the behavior? What, what do we start with in that one? One of the things I like to, to look at, Dr. Janine, is that 
having a conversation with the inner self can truly be as easy as creating a new friendship. And so when we have a new human friendship, we find commonalities, we set boundaries, we try and create an intimate but positive connection. And it is the same way with that inner voice, just pausing. So the first step is pause to notice when the inner voice, and we all have one, we all have one, we, when that inner voice walks in the room. So just like a friend walking in the room, notice the energy that comes. Okay. So first we notice when she comes in. So we notice the entry. Then we notice the energy. Is it positive or is it negative? So really notice the energy, the feeling that comes up. Is she happy? Is she sad? Is she nasty? And then we can actually either out loud or to ourselves say, Hey, what's going on here? What's, what's going on here? What do you, why are you saying you can't do this? And then she might talk back and say, because you're not good enough. (laughs) And then we can talk back and say, well, actually I am good enough. I can look at all the successes in my life and really accomplish this. Okay and then set her aside. We don't need to engage with her if she is being, or it might be a him for some of my clients, and this is really important. Their inner voice goes back to things maybe that a father or an uncle, a male figure said. And so it's very common for for people, men and women, to hear the voice of a parent. That is that has come such a part of them. I have one client where every time she picks up a carb to eat, you know, <laughs> breadstick, anything, she can hear her dad's voice saying, you're fat, you're going to get fat, you need to exercise. And so she, now she equates every carb almost with that negative nagging in her voice. So the first step is just to be aware that it's there. Ask it if it's helpful. That's the second step after noticing the energy. And then if it's if it's productive, learn the lesson. If it's not productive, ask it to leave. Very much like a relationship with another human being. We've just internalized this relationship. Makes sense. Makes sense. How old do you think people are when they first develop this inner relationship with their other voices or the self-esteem voice? You know, that is such a good question. And here's something that's really important that I found in my client work, that those negative inner voices often arise early in childhood, not always from a comment directed to the self. It can be a comment directed to somebody else in the family an older brother, a mother, a sister, a father, that is basically translating as, if you do this, you will not be loved and rejected. So sometimes we simply learn and become afraid by watching an older sibling tell, you know, another sibling, you're fat, you're lazy, you're not good enough. So we unconsciously absorb that and say, okay, the person was on a couch eating popcorn. They're told they're fat and ugly and lazy. Therefore, being on a couch eating popcorn, not being busy and productive means you're fat, ugly, and lazy because we're taking it in when the brain is, you know, young and really soaks and absorbs things on a very literal level. And so I think that it's important to know that it starts very, very early in life often pre-verbal when we're just witnessing different life experiences. And then the more we think about it and expose to it, like anything, the more it becomes hardwired in the brain. And I think it's also really important to know that when it comes to self-esteem, and this might make people feel really good, is that our self-esteem actually peaks, according to research, at age 60. Hmm. And so it's important to know that as we work 
in life, at listening to the inner voice, at self-correcting, at being more aware of our attributes and less focused on the things that we don't do so well, that self-esteem actually will continue to grow. The other piece that's really important for listeners to know is that self-esteem is different from self-confidence. Self-confidence is generally limited to external characteristics, traits, attributes that you have grown and created in certain areas of life or in your physicality. So therefore, you might be very um, self-confident in your work in your typing skills, in your um, business acumen. You might be very self-confident when it comes to your physical appearance because you're, you know, at some ideal weight for for you or whatever it is. However, self-esteem is very different. It is not dependent on your physical characteristics. It is not dependent upon how much money you have or the fancy clothes you have or the car you drive. Self-esteem is something you are not born with. It is something you grow throughout life by facing life experiences, learning from them, getting up when you fall, and continuing to build and build and build throughout life. So that's one of the really beautiful parts about self-esteem is that where something like looks is something you're built, you're born with or not born with, something like really great skills at being a ballerina or soccer player, you know, generally it's some part that you're born with that allows you to achieve that level. Um, But self-esteem is not confined that way. It is something that every one of us can work on and notice and nurture so that we can become really proud of who we are and strong within the core. I'm glad that you described the difference between self-esteem and self-confidence because I was kind of lumping them in the same category in my mind as being kind of the same thing. But now I'm going, okay, I see the difference between the two. And I'm thinking probably a lot of folks are going, okay, so if I'm going to peak with self-esteem at 60 and maybe someone's in their 30s or 40s as I am currently, I'm going, yes, I can see I'm a lot better than I was when I was 20 for sure. I think a lot of folks might be thinking, okay, so how do we strengthen this self-esteem? What can we do like as a daily practice? I know you were talking about recognizing triggers and then working on the conversations in the head. What would be a process that someone might be able to start going through? Absolutely reading your book, by the way. (laughs) Got to add that in there. But what would be a process in which someone might start working on strengthening their self-esteem so that by the time they get into their 60s and beyond, things are going to be really dialed in. I think that I've touched on it, but I'll really amplify it here. It's a few things. Focusing on your pot- positive attributes, nourishing them, looking at the things that you don't do so well, working to correct and and enliven those areas if possible, accepting the ones that simply are not, you simply can't shift them. So being wise about that. Then the other piece is really, really important because it means that you get out there, you put yourself out there, knowing that you might stumble, right, when you're trying something new, but knowing that self-esteem really comes, not just from being positive, not just from talking to the inner voice, but also from trying new experiences, making yourself vulnerable, learning the lesson that comes with it if you stumble, and then patting yourself on the back for getting out there and doing something, even if it means that it was maybe not so successful. And so that is how, if we had a perfect childhood, that is how our parents would have worked with us. And sometimes we don't get that in childhood, or sometimes we do get it in childhood and kind of lose it along the way. But really, the way that it works, as ideally, is that we keep 
doing more of what feels good, more of what feels affirming, more of what feels challenging, and saying, wow, I didn't do so well here, but I did super great over here. Next time, I'll shift it up a little bit this way. Wow, I'm growing and learning and changing. And so I think that that, oh, here's another beautiful piece, is that takes us away from being focused on our looks, which is what really can hang up so many people. When we really focus on the inner work, which is what matters, you know, that self-esteem, that, that empowerment, when we work on that more and more, we're less aware of what other people are doing or wearing or saying or being because we're focused on making this being in the here and now be the best version that he or she can possibly be. And that is the way to build healthy self-esteem. I like it. I like it a lot. I mean, I think as we get older and we, we work on these things, just like you were saying, and, you know, kind of put it to, I'm trying to think of the words. If we're able to just be like the heck with everyone else, I'm just going to grow myself and grow who I am and, and be, you know, the person I want to be. It seems like things will just fall together. In fact, a friend of mine, I believe it was just yesterday morning because I was getting prepared for this podcast. I had some girls on, uh, we got together on Saturday and we were like, okay, this is what the podcast is for this week. Let's uh, talk about, you know, our issues with self-esteem. And, and one of my girlfriends just messaged me on, uh, it was a, a message was on, I think it was on Instagram, whatever. Anyway, it was, it was a message that said, no one is going to remember you or value you for how amazing your hair was how gorgeous your face was. They're going to be remembering you for the skills, how you helped them, how you contributed to their life, your looks, your weight, none of that contributes to someone else's life. And I thought that was pretty cool to think about it that way, because I think many of us tie our ability or worthiness for love, our ability or worthiness for success to our looks or to our physical appearance. Absolutely. And sadly enough, a lot of that begins in childhood. So I don't want listeners to feel that there's something wrong with them or broken in them, that we do become in many ways in families, um, very appearance focused. And I want to share a really sad statistics with you. In a study carried out among female students, 80% of them felt that their negative body image was linked to the negative remarks made by friends and family. Oof. Wow. 80%. 80%. Another stat, I'm going to give you three that I find really profoundly sad. The other one, 85% of the world's population is affected by low self-esteem. Third stat, low self-esteem is the universal common denominator among literally all people suffering from addictions to any and all mind-altering substances such as alcohol. Not genes, mind you, but, you know, so this isn't the, the genetic component. We are looking at the fact that self-esteem, low, low self-esteem is an underlying factor for many, if not most or all addictions. And it makes sense when we think about it from that inner voice, right? Mm -hmm. If I have this mean, nasty inner voice is constantly criticizing me and she or he just won't shut up, it'd be mighty tempting, wouldn't it, to pick up a beer or a pill or, you know, a new pair of shoes, something, right, to make myself feel better, even if for 32 minutes, right? And that's the piece that when we really start slowing it down and realizing that self-esteem work really has to come from being kind to the self, being gentle with the self, being real with the self, 
knowing we're all flawed, we're all imperfect and being real with yourself that way. But then saying, wait a second, what I want to work on is me being the most loving, honest, respectful, kind, compassionate person possible. And that must start with the inner voice. Because as my mantra goes, there is nothing we can say or do, be it good or not so good, that does not emanate from within the self, radiate out to others, and ultimately rest in the home where it began, the self. <laughs> Wow. Wow. So we've got a lot of information in terms today, in terms of thinking about the self and how to improve the self. I think a lot of people here on social media or other podcasts, whatever, it's all about body positivity and positivity. And in my mind, I've talked, you know, I've thought through it in my head. I can't get rid of some of the negative voice with just straight positivity. I've Absolutely. got to go deeper. Absolutely. That's the piece where talking to the inner voice is critical because research shows that if we simply ignore a thought, if you know the old polar bear or pink elephant <laughs> research, right? If I say, hey, don't think about a polar bear or a pink elephant, me telling you not to think about that research backs us up, you're going to think about it more. So really, it's taking a bit of a cognitive behavioral twist to it, which is check in with the cognition, <laughs> check in with the thought. If it's not helping, switch it and then move on. Just ignoring it isn't generally helpful. And this is the beautiful piece. And I really want listeners just to sit with this for a sec, please, that we think that what is coming out of our brain is true, that what is coming out of our mind is true. But that's not necessarily the case in so many situations. Your mind, that scurrying little hamster wheel thing it does, it's just a tiny, tiny piece of you and you get to train it. You get to tell it what to do and what not to do. You don't have to be at its mercy. And that's what happens for so many of us, self-included. I've been there. I can get at the mercy of that little racing hamster wheel, whatever it wants to bother me with on any given day. And I have learned to tell it. I look at it. I talk to it. I say, okay, this isn't helpful. I choose not to engage with you right now. And I put it aside. And the more I do that firmly, just like I'm talking to a child, a child or a toddler, because indeed it often has the energy of a child or a toddler. And the firmer I am and the more I repeat that, the less it comes. And there are times for all of us when we're feeling low or sick or have had a stressful day that that voice really thinks it is a perfect opportunity to just come in and harass us. And I've learned to notice that and to say, okay, I know I'm weary. I know I'm feeling a little off here, but no, this is not a good time for you to step in. In fact, it's the worst time for you to step in. So get out of here. I love that. I love that. And I think that's, you know, that's an important thing that you know, I'm trying to help put out there with my podcast, help put out there just in general with patients is creating these habits that create overall health. I think a lot of people think about habits in terms of I'm going to eat healthy, I'm going to exercise, and they tie that to habits. But you can have this habit of literally embracing the fact that your brain tells you things, but not everything comes out as true. So you can change whatever it says into what you want. Or how you want to be or how you want to feel. And absolutely. I love this. I love this. It's a different way of thinking about it because I honestly, before today, never really thought about the fact that I could tell my brain to think differently. I mean, in a way, yes, I've thought about it, but not, not to the point where I was like, wait a minute, that's a habit I can create. A new habit because it's already going to happen. The brain's going to tell me things. And I love to create new habits that are good on top of ones that you already have ingrained. We're all going to talk to ourselves. So. Absolutely. And if I may say this for listeners, because it's an important piece, 
often I'll have a client come in with the self-esteem issues. We'll work on these kind of, you know, basic strategies. And they'll come in two weeks later and they'll say, I'm not feeling any better. The thoughts are still there. And I'll say, well, were you using the skills that we talked about? Were you retraining your brain? And they'll say, no. <laughs> and I'll say, well, that's because, you know, the reason the thoughts are still there is because you're not doing the retraining. So listeners, few pieces of really helpful information, slow and steady change, re retraining your brain is possible, but it takes conscious commitment dedicated effort and being very strict for a while and here's how it works new research shows that new habits take on average 66 days to become really part of your way of being this is for so so any habit you're creating new self-esteem better self-esteem better eating habits about 66 days of concerted effort and there's something called the 2190 rule. And the 2190 rule simply means that if you want to make a change, like kinder self talk, commit to it for 21 days, working on it, working on it, working on it daily, really catching yourself non judgmentally in the act of, you know, being self critical or whatever. Say, oh, it's here again. Okay, I really don't need to listen to you. Okay, bye bye. And working on that. Put it on the calendar, 21 days. I'm going to commit to this. And then once you've done it for 21 days, if you can keep it up for 90 days, you will have likely successfully created a new habit that will be with you for a lifetime. Not that that voice won't come in now and again, especially when you're low, especially after a fight with your sweetheart or, you know, going into a wait, wait uh, not a dressing room, right? <laughs> Take a little dip, right? But the idea is know that it won't happen by magic. There's no magic pill for it. There's no magic exercise I can give you like journaling, right? It will be a combination of giving concerted, loving, devoted effort to paying attention to your kind inner voice, creating more of that and reducing the comparison to others, being really present with all your capacities. And if you have a, a failure or a stumble, assessing it honestly and then leaving it, leaving it behind you and doing that, practicing that for 21 days and then 90 days and see what happens. That's awesome. I like that. I like that a lot. Ah, oh, so... For the folks out there that are going, okay, I like this. I want to figure out how to do this. Dr. Manley has two books that are amazing, Joy from Fear and Aging Joyfully. And in both of those books, she allows you to write down your thoughts, write down the homework. So you're actually not being forced. I mean, it's just at the end of each chapter, you've got to put the work in. So if you're someone that's going, oh, that's nice, but I don't know if I can commit to writing things down or, or, or really working on this in, in my head, we have help for you. So, Dr. Manley, tell us a little bit about where folks can find you, where folks can get more information from you, some support in terms of just info you're putting out on Twitter, because you've been Twittering a lot lately, I've noticed. Because um, <laughs> I, I think that your information is so valuable. You come with a, a fresh, unique perspective, and just the act of actually changing behavior, doing something, because I have way too many patients that will go and seek counseling, but they're never given anything to do. They just talk, 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 but there's no action. And I love this action steps with changing the thoughts and doing 21 days and then working for the 90 days. I just love it. So tell everybody where they can find you, where they can get some info from you in terms of what's happening and, and just some advice. Okay. So let me start you with this. I believe just to address this, I believe in many forms of psychotherapy, but I am big on 
homework. Here's why. If a client comes to see me or you're listening to a podcast for 50 minutes, and you know, that's about the, the average time of many podcasts and many therapy sessions, and then you don't act on what you hear, you're not doing the work that we need to do to create any new behavior. So as much as I believe in talk therapy, I also believe in talk therapy augmented by homework that takes people into doing things, even if it's as, if it's as simple as for somebody who feels lonely. I don't just talk to them about their loneliness. I help them get out there to volunteer, to do things, to actually shift life. So if you're in therapy, ask your therapist to give you assignments to help you shift your life, to help you shift it to actually put it into practice. So that's the first thing. Second thing, you can find me on Facebook, Dr. Carla Manley, Instagram, Dr. Carla Manley, Twitter, Dr. Carla Manley, um, let's see, LinkedIn, Dr. Carla Manley, and my website, drcarlamanley.com. Here's a really important thing about my website. If you don't have the resources or simply want to augment your work, um, look on my website for free downloads. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to do anything. Free, three free downloads under the Your Journey section. That will get you started. They actually kind of give you a glimpse of the type of work that you would encounter um, within my books, Aging Joyfully and Joy from Fear, which can be really fun, fun work. So, you know, it's, it's don't, don't be stressed about it. Some of it's deep, but some of it's really fun and enlightening. So if you want some free downloads, go to my website under the Your Journey section. Feel free to copy them, share them with friends. They're there to help you learn to love you a little bit more. And my books through my awesome publisher, Familius Publishing, you can find them on barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, and of course, through your local bookstore, because I'm a big supporter of our local companies. And IndieBound can help you find them by just typing in your zip code and you'll find an independent bookstore near you that carries the books. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for sharing all of that. I will also have all of that information folks in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com or the health fix podcast.com. Thank you, Dr. Carla, again, for coming on. You're always such a wealth of information, and we are definitely going to keep chatting because I think there's so many different topics that we could go through to help folks out because I think a lot of folks just need the nudge. They just need to hear that they can do this. That just requires a little bit of work, but it's there. The tools are there within you, and you can do it. You can absolutely do it. You are not alone. You are not defective. You are not broken. You are just human. And the goal is why we both work so hard in the fields that we do. The goal is to help you be the healthiest, most wonderful, self-affirmed you possible. So go for it. Thank you, Dr. Manley. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Be well, and thanks for having me. You're most welcome. Subscribe, rate, and share info. 